they we had one big chief standing elk who kept saying it would be better if we should go there so they're trying to get them to push towards the south like towards Oklahoma would be what would be Oklahoma and they're kind of against it they don't want to walk anymore they feel like they hey look we came here we we were supposed to be here mm-hmm. and they're saying no oh, no you know we're gonna we're, we're gonna move you guys south and they're all saying no we don't want to so that's what standing elk is talking about so standing elk who kept saying it would be better if we should go there I think there were not as many as 10 Cheyennes and a whole tribe who agreed with him. There was a feeling that he was talking this way only to make himself a big Indian among the white people. The white men chiefs would not talk much to any Cheyenne chief but him. They gave him extra presents and treated him as if he were the only tribe, the only chief in the tribe. But he was but one of our 40 tribal big chiefs. One day he went about telling everybody, all right, get ready to move. The soldiers are going to take us from here tomorrow. Lots of Cheyennes were angry. We had understood that when we surrendered, we were to live on our same White River Reservation. We had given up our guns and our horses and had quit fighting because of this promise. Now, after we had put ourselves at this great disadvantage, the promise was to be broken. But we could not do anything except obey him. So three sleeps after my small band had come to what we thought was to be our home, the whole tribe was on its way to what we now call Oklahoma. So, again, that's why we don't give up our guns. When you give up your guns, you give up your strength, you give up your leverage, give up your ability to fight. The soldier leader of our movement to the south was known as Tall White Man. He was a good man, always kind to the Indians. We had to do whatever he said we must do, but he talked good to our chiefs. So all of us were pleased to have him guiding us. He had with him a band of soldiers. I do not know how many, but I think there may have been almost a hundred of them. Our horses that had been taken away from us at the agency were returned to us. Still many Cheyennes did not own any. Old people who had no animal to ride were provided with them from the soldier herd or very old or sick people were allowed to ride in the soldier wagons. Young men who owned no horses had to walk or borrow from friends. I owned four. I had three of them loaned out most of the time. So that's actually the the treatment at this point by tall white man was fairly good. And it sounds like they kind of got along with the soldiers at this point. And here's an example of that. Soldiers hunted with the Indians. All the soldiers were friendly and good to us. They were good shooters and they killed lots of game. They gave us most of the meat. I became specifically friendly with two or three of them. I liked to be with them and they appeared to like me. I went at times to their camp in the evening and visited with them. When we were about halfway along on our journey, I asked one of them, let me take your gun tomorrow. Yes, you may take it, he told me. So I I think the reason I, I... I wanted to bring that up is when you get, you know, soldiers and warriors and you put them together and you get rid of the politics. Guess what? They get along. Mm -hmm. Oh, we like shooting. We like hunting. We're warriors. We're going to get along. Mm Kind of like the Germans playing playing soccer. Playing soccer. Exactly. You take the politics out of it and we're just going to, you know, have a couple cigarettes, maybe a glass of scotch and call it good. Mm Mm-hmm. 